On this lesson, we will find inverse functions algebraically. But before we start discussing the actual procedure to properly define inverse functions algebraically, let's just recall what is one of the big properties for inverse functions. Well, remember that for any function, you have a value of f of x and you get a value of y. Let's call f of x. Now the inverse function, which right now we're just going to represent it as g of x, it does quite the opposite. You plug in the y that you got from the original function and it's going to give you the x that it comes from. So if f of x, it's a function when you plug in an x and it gives you a y, well, the inverse function, which right now we're going to just label it as g of x, it does the opposite. You plug in the y that you got from the original and it's going to give you the x where it came from. So recall that that's the big idea for inverse functions. Now, how can we properly find algebraically an inverse function? Well, first, we have to discuss the correct notation to indicate inverse functions. So right now, if my function is labeled as f of x, then the notation that we're going to be using for inverse function is going to be f with a little negative one. This is not an exponent of negative one, but this is just the notation that we're going to indicate that the function is the inverse of x. So f with a negative, negative one on top of it, that's just the notation that we're going to be using to say that this function, it's an inverse function. So now that we have discussed the notation a little bit, let's actually go through the procedure to find an inverse function. Well, first, if your function is written as f of x, let's just change f of x as the y. And now to properly find the inverse function, We're going to do two steps, but the first one, we're going to switch the x's and the y. So what do we mean by this? So if this is my original function, every time there was a y, I'm going to replace it with an x. And every time there was an x, I'm going to replace it with the y. So I'm just switching the places. Whenever there was an x, now there's a y. And whenever there's a y, now there's an x. So this will always be the first step. And the second step is to solve for, I'm going to call it the new y. In other words, notice that originally my y was already isolated. So if I switch places between x and y, now notice that my y is not isolated. So now that's what we have to do. We got to solve for this new y. So now, Let's solve for the new y once the x's and the y have been flipped. So since, and again, every procedure is going to be different depending on how the function has been defined. But notice that here we have a fraction equals to another fraction. So what we can do to properly get our procedure going is we can cross multiply. So now, and again, for this x, we can always assume that there's a denominator of one and that's fine. So if we cross multiply, I'm gonna get x times two y plus one. And that's going to be equals to, if I cross multiply here, that's going to be equals to just 1 times 4y minus 3. And now that we have this, it's just a lot of algebraic manipulation to properly solve for our y. So in this case, notice that the x gets distributed. And if my x is distributed, I'm going to get 2xy plus x. And that's going to be equals to 4y minus 3. And again, we're solving for y. So those variables that have a y on it or those terms that have a y on it, I'm going to keep them on the left. So let me subtract for y on one side. And at the same time, to save some space, I'm going to take away the x. So now this cancels out. So if we do that properly, we're going to end up with 2xy minus 4y. And that's going to be equal to negative 3 minus x. So now that we have all the y's on one side, notice that they both have a y in common. So therefore I can factor it out. So if I factor on a y, I'm going to get 2x minus 4. 
and the right hand side is still the right hand side so that's still going to be equal to minus 3 minus x to properly solve for this y we're just going to divide it now so we got 2x minus 4 and we got 2x minus 4 so now that gets cancelled out and that's fantastic because now we have properly solved for this so-called new y and this is the inverse function of the original. So if my function was defined as 4x minus 3 over 2x plus 1, the inverse of this function is going to be equivalent to negative 3 minus x over 2x minus 4. And the last thing that we need to do is that we have to use the correct notation. So therefore, the inverse function of f is just the result that we got here. So now this is the correct notation for the inverse function. So here we have a function which is defined as f. And now the inverse of that function, it's equivalent to negative 3 minus x over 2x minus 4. And notice that this process was not just magic flying out of nowhere. All we did, we used this idea that we got here. So if x, if you plug in an x to a function, you get a y. Well, the inverse should do the opposite. You plug in a y and you should come at an x. In other words, the x takes the value of y and the y takes the value of x. And that is the reason why we have to switch the x's and the y as our first step. And the rest is just to solve for my new y. So let's do another example here. Again, my first step is if my function is written as f of x, let me just write it as y. So that's always going to be my first step. It's just going to make our computation easier. And now my second step is I'm going to switch all the x's with the y and all the y's with an x. So here we had a y, so now it becomes an x. Here we have an x, now it becomes a y. And my last step is to solve for my new y. So let's solve for my new y. So there's only one y available here. So that's going to make our computation a little bit easier. So let's start by adding 3 fourths on both sides. So that's going to cancel out. And now we're going to end up with x plus 3 over 4. It's equivalent to 5 over 6 y. So let's just solve for that y. One thing that we can do is we can multiply by the reciprocal. And by doing this, now the 5y's are going to cancel out. And now I'm going to end up with the y. So now y is going to be equivalent to 6x over 5 plus 18 over, uh, what's that, 20. Now notice that we have solved for the so-called new y. So all we got to do is just use the correct notation. So if my function was defined as f of x, then the inverse function, which again, it is illustrated as f negative 1 of x, and I guess this negative 1 is not an exponent, it's just notation that we use, that's equivalent to the result that we got from our previous calculation. And again, all we're doing to properly define it algebraically, we're switching the x's and the y's, and we're solving for the new y. Let's do another example. Let's do another example here. Again, here we have a function. Our task is to properly define the inverse function. So first step, if I see f of x, I'm going to just replace it with the y. My second step, it's always to switch x's and y. So there was a y there. Now it's going to be an x. There was an x there. Now it's going to be a y. And my last step is to solve for this new y. So let's solve for this new y. So let's isolate that new y. The first thing that I notice is I need to get rid of this one. So that's done. And now my result is going to be x plus 1 equals negative y plus 2 over 2. Let me get rid of this negative. Let me just divide both sides by negative 1. So now that cancels out. So now I'm going to end up with negative x minus 1 equals y plus 2 over 2. 
I want to solve for that y. It has the whole expression has an exponent of two. So we're going to take the square root on both sides. So now I'm going to end up with the square root of negative x minus one. It's going to be equivalent to y plus two. And I notice that the y is almost by itself. So at the end, we just got to subtract two here. So now finally, our result is that y, it's equivalent to the square root of negative x minus one minus two on the outside. So even though this is my inverse function, notice that I need to go a little bit further because here I'm gonna have the square root and there's a variable inside the square root. So I gotta do a little bit of work because now I need to define the domain where this is true. Notice that at least we want to find out when is the inside of a square root positive? So uh, let's just define that domain a little bit more realistically. So here we have plus one. And now we're going to end up that negative x is less than or equal to one. I want to solve for x. So let me divide by negative one on top of it. And remember that when you divide by negative, at least the direction of the inequality, they switch a sign. So here we have it. We're only allowed to choose values that are less than or equal to negative one. So now that we have that, let's use the correct notation. Because now the correct notation is that the inverse function of f, which we illustrate as f on negative one x, it's equivalent to the square root of negative one minus two, where x is less than or equal to negative one. And again, here, at least in this example, we needed to go a little bit further. It was not sufficient to just write down the inverse function because we can see that inside the square root, we have a variable and variables can take any values. And remember that inside the square root, at least if, you're sec if your root it's of an even degree, which it is since it is a root of two, we wanna make sure that the inside it's always positive. So that's why I needed to go a little bit further to properly define the domain of the inverse. So that's what we needed to just write down the domain or at least the values of x's that we're allowed to choose. So with this, it concludes our lesson to properly find algebraically inverse functions, but everything just boils down to these two steps. Once you have a function, if you want to define the inverse of that function, the first thing that you want to do, you want to switch the x's and the y, and then you got to solve for the new y. And again, the reason why we have to switch the x's and the y is because of the main, I, the main property that inverse functions have. The domain of the function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the inverse is the domain of the function. In other words, the x's and the y, they switch places with each other.